Good morning. Welcome to SDL History Live. I know the weather out there is kind of spooky, but that goes perfectly with our presentation this morning, Spooky St. Louis. I'm Tammy Goldman. I'm Director of Tourism and Group Sales. And today I'm your host, or more aptly, uh, the technical assistant to ensure the program runs smoothly. So due to our present situation, nearly all of our programming is virtual, which is of course why you're here. Um, however, we did want to remind you that the Missouri History Museum, Soldiers Memorial, and our library are open to visit Wednesday through Sunday. Because your safety is our top priority, the capacity to all the buildings are restricted and we do require advanced reservations. They're easily done. All the tickets are timed entry and free, um, but you just do need to reserve them. You go to plan your visit on the website, um, mohistory.org. Before we begin, I do want to send my special thanks to all of those in the audience that are members of the Missouri Historical Society. If you're not and would like to, we would certainly, certainly love that. I'll provide a link to um, missourihistorymuseum.org slash support that you can visit. But thank you so much to all of those that do support us, as well as my great appreciation to the Zoo Museum Tax District and those of you in the audience that live in the St. Louis City and County, your tax dollars are sincerely appreciated. So just a few questions, or a few questions, a few moments of your time further just to go into some details on how the program's gonna run this morning. It will be roughly 30 to 40 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes um, question and answers. You can submit your questions towards the end of the program um, in the Q&A button that's found on your toolbar. Please know we will do our very best to get to as many as we can, but there may be that case that we can't get to all of them. But again, we're gonna do our very best to get to all those questions. Today's presentation is being recorded. So if you'd like to view it again or share it with others, um, it will be posted in a few days on the Missouri Historical Society's YouTube channel. As always, your feedback is very, very important to us. We would really appreciate it if you could take a few minutes after this program is over to answer a short survey. You will see a Kobo toolbox um, survey that will pop up in another tab on your browser. Please so please keep an eye out for that when you leave this session. So let's get to why you're all here today. Um, the program this morning is presented by the one and only our friend, Johnny Rabbit. This presentation was originally supposed to be a guided bus tour as a part of our discovery tour series. However, as you know, that couldn't happen. So Rabbit has wonderfully condensed his normally six hour tour into this 40 minute presentation. So please sit back, watch your screens, and enjoy the ride. With that, I will let Rabbit take it away. All right, we are ready to take it away. Ah, whoa, my goodness, we're taking it away. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everybody. I hope Herman Krems, the late Herman Krems, is not listening today and watching this. He died in 1911, and I have his hat here. Right? It's, a, it's not the usual hat I wear with the rabbit ears, but I could do that because it's one of those collapsible hats. And I'm sure, according to the people who live in his house in Botanical, he uh, appears there probably looking for this hat. So I hope he's not watching the program, but I'm glad you are with us for the program today. And we're going to um, take a look now as we get to the, I hope, the pictures that we want to show. Oops, Eric, are you, can you help us with this, Eric? Yeah. We're gonna try this again. Is that searching for the, for the pictures? Aha, now we're getting closer and closer and we'll have the pictures right there good well we're in good shape then it's scary when you do a show like this something always goes a little bit wacky a little bit strange when you do a strange show all right well here's a question 
Are ghosts, demons, spirits, and haunted places actually real? Now, you may find out today, and if they are, keep this line in mind from the song Ghostbusters by Ray Parker Jr. in radio. It's, I ain't afraid of no ghost. It seems that ghosts, while kind of spooky, kind of scary, are seldom malevolent, rarely cause harm to the living, and I'd imagine everyone Zooming with us today is living, but if not, you too are welcome. The spirits do welcome you. And even though we'll uncover lots of the unknown, it's not possible to get to everything because we are the most haunted building in America, city in America, with so many haunted buildings, houses, and cemeteries and other places. We'll seek the supernatural in this sort of a parade of the paranormal, of which we'll tell about those lovable loony limps of brewery, mansion, cave, suicide, and ghost fame. We'll reveal the strange story of the 20th century St. Louis housewife who, with a Ouija board, channeled a spirit from the 17th century. And it was a big deal. And we'll get demonic details of the terrifying tale of our city's most famous exorcism. The spirit world is taken seriously by many, such as those who follow the spiritualist religion. They tell of the community that they're in and the continuity of life through spirit communication. They have a, a church, the Fifth Spiritualist Church on South Kings Highway. And one thing that will tell you is that a ghost and a spirit are not the same. They're not one and the same as they see it, a living being who has died and for some reason has not seen the light of heaven is then an ethereal entity called a ghost. And a ghost is relegated to spending all of the afterlife here on earth. While those who have been allowed into the great beyond are spirits and they, if they want to, can maybe spend a little time in their eternity going back and forth. So uh, that's their belief. I've lectured on the paranormal uh, a heck of a lot of places, had a lot of radio programs. I was listening to one earlier today. I just hadn't marked on here ghost. I did it years ago with Robbie Cordaway, who we will talk about a little later on. Um, and I've worked with a lot of authors and researchers in the science and study of the supernatural. Two that come to mind, Phil Goodwilling and Gordon Hayner. For over three decades, they had a spirit-seeking organization called Haunt Hunters, on which the movie Ghostbusters was in a great part based. The late Harold Ramis, he co-wrote the movie, learned of the Haunt Hunters when he was a student at Washington U, and the hunters were investigating the ghost of the Whittemore House, which is the Washington U Faculty Club on Fourth Side. Uh, Ramus also studied the book, The Haunt Hunters, and you can do that too. It's at the university's Olin Library. Now, What Lies Beneath? That's a title of a very scary movie with Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer, a supernatural movie from, I think, 20 years ago. I, last week in the Post, Valerie Shrimp Han did an article called What Lies Beneath? It's about certain cemeteries located under area parks, including St. Marcus and Gravois in St. Louis, Faust Park in Chesterfield, and Babbler State Park. Valerie is married to Andy Hahn. He is the director of the haunted Campbell House Museum. That's down at 15th and Locust. Yep, a ghost or two is there. And also what lies beneath our city are springs and streams and a huge spooky limestone cave system. Well, after our talk, as uh, Tammy said, you may ask questions, make comments, and maybe tell us something paranormal that you have experienced. We'd love to hear about it. Well, here comes a rare and colorful view from the Missouri Historical Society collection. This is a place that this view is from 1866, and it became a park. A guy named Ezra English started a brewery there, uh, cleverly named the English Brewery, on this site in 1826. It was in the building that we see in the background. Ezra selected the place to take advantage of the cave complex, which is sort of like a subterranean city, about 40 feet or so under this pastoral setting. He used the cavern to keep his porter and ales cool, plus he also had the very first underground beer garden in the city of St. Louis. Now, before he established his business at this site, the cave was known as Indian Cave. <clears throat> and it is believed by some to be haunted by an Indian maiden and her brave. 
As the story goes, the couple had wanted to marry, but she'd been promised to the tribe's vicious war chief, and she didn't like him. So the young couple hid in the cave. The chief found out. He stationed warriors at cave entrances, thinking the girl would finally come out and be his bride. But the chief's plan was thwarted as the couple refused to come out of hiding and remained very possibly lost deep in the dark underground labyrinth until they starved to death. Their skeletal remains were found many years later, but their sad spirits remain. And many who have gone into the cave say they have heard crying as well as voices speaking in a strange tongue. And today, it's one of 108 parks in the city of St. Louis. It's Benton Park, beautiful oasis, and it's how the place appeared in this picture in 1900. Now that lake, great looking lake, it's man-made, and on occasion, well into the mid-20th century, it would become bone dry as cracks periodically drain the water into the cave. Problem has been resolved through technology. Well, now we go to the other side of the river. We take a look back at this place. In 1859, the Monticello Female Seminary, now Lewis and Clark College, it's in Godfrey, Illinois. Since her death in 1907, the school and its students have been protected by the ghost of Harriet Newell Haskell, who had been the school principal from 19, 1867 to 1907. And if you're there and you get a whiff of lilac cologne, Harriet's favorite scent, there is a good chance Harriet is nearby. Now this was the Alton Military Prison, which did not get a AAA five diamond rating. Uh, the foreboding place that we see opened as the Illinois State Penitentiary in 1833, but gained its notoriety during the Civil War as a Union prison for Confederate soldiers and uh, followers of the Confederate States. Place was closed in 1860, but reactivated in 1862 to help relieve the overcrowding of war prisoners in the same city of St. Louis. But by the end of the Civil War, over 11,000 prisoners had been incarcerated here. And by any standards, it was a horrific place, especially during the smallpox epidemic of 1863, which was not dissimilar from our current pandemic. And all during its three years of operation as a military prison, over 1,500 people died within its walls. The gruesome place was raised and a park was created on that site Interestingly, a name for the Joe Chandler Harris character, Uncle Remus. You might find it of interest to visit there. Stand near one of the remaining fragments of the prison walls to see if any restless spirits in some way reach out to you as they have to so many others who have done that. As far as I know, this Confederate monument hasn't been toppled. The 58-foot-high obelisk is dedicated to Confederate prisoners who died at that Alton prison. On it, on this uh, monument that we see, there are plaques that have the names of all identified prisoners who died there. And over the past 155 years, this too has been documented as a place where spirits have been known to roam, and both it and the prison site are frequented by ghost hunters, paranormal researchers, and just the curious. Uh, the monument was erected in 1909, and it's in the North Alton Confederate Cemetery on Rosier Street. Now we move back to this side of the river. Well, that uh, was a really beautiful building. At least it looked like a beautiful building on the outside. It's an 1864 painting by Martin Stadler, and we get a glimpse of the Gratiot Street Military Prison at 8th and Gratiot, originally part of both the first Christian Brothers College High School, the McDowell Medical College, and the McDowell Family Home. The school, operated by Joseph Dow McDowell, uh, he was kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde. He was definitely a very fine surgeon and a good teacher, but he was also a hopeless alcoholic and a notorious grave robber. The good doctor, who was called a corpse collector, was also very superstitious. And... He was known as Mad Dr. McDowell by many, said he was often in contact with the ghost of his dead mother, his dead daughter, and others from the spirit world. At the onset of the war between the states, McDowell was appointed Surgeon General of the Confederate States and headed south. When the Union Army of the Republic 
took over this building for a Confederate prison, they removed over three wagon loads full of human bones left by the doctor for whatever he was doing. They were in the basement. The building, which was considered to be haunted, was demolished in 1878. The area is now where Ralston Purina is located. Well, here's a hospital of infamy. This was the Alexian Brothers Hospital. The institution was started in late 1869 in the former Simmons Mansion of South Broadway on the 4th of July, 1874. Incidentally, that was the same day that General Sherman officiated at the opening of Eads Bridge. This place, well, looks spooky on its own, but years later, something quite strange and quite evil would happen there. Uh, we'll talk about that later. I'll just mention that on Holy Saturday, April 16th, 8, 19, in 1949, a statue of St. Michael the Archangel was placed in a certain room at the Alexian Brothers Hospital. The doctor may still be in. If you were doing a sight search for a movie that needed a haunted house, this one could be just what the doctor ordered. It's the former residence of the eccentric but noted and respected physician, Dr. Franz Arst. It's at 2322 South 12th Street, right at the corner of Lamai and Sularn. And though this image dates to 143 years ago, looks the same today. It was built between 1873 and 77 and was one of the most talked about mansions in St. Louis of the 19th century. Dr. Arst, he had his medical office and a small hospital behind the house at the alley facing Lamai in a building that's still there. And he constructed a cave himself uh, under 12th Street that he fitted out with real stalactites and stalagmites that he collected from all over the world. The cave also served as a tunnel to the house on the west side of the street uh, in his office and hospital. The nurses and some of his employees lived in the house across 12th Street. Oh, some of this strange subterranean world remains intact. The couple restoring the home do believe in ghosts. They say once lived in a haunted house in Kirkwood that's been documented in books. Uh, and they feel that France arts may still be around. In addition, spirit photographers, there are quite a few of those, they often catch inexplicable orbs in their photos of this place. They soon to be happy homeowners of it, now live in a, a uh, big mansion at a private place in the Central West End. They're the owners of the Fountain and Locust at 3037 Locust. And here's our commercial, I have to do a commercial. They always do it on radio. If you're a fan of ice cream, I suggest going there to enjoy my concoction, the Johnny Rabbit Monkey Malt. But don't go there for ghosts because the Fountain and Locust is not haunted. A life cut short, but the spirit remains. This is a steel engraving from 1883 of our state's second governor, Frederick Bates. Bates was in office for just nine months when he died at his home in Chesterfield after an illness thought to be pneumonia. He was 48 years old. Bates was laid to rest at the family cemetery there at Thornhill, his family estate, which is now part of Faust Park. Bates' home at Thornhill was built in 1819, and according to many, especially those who work there, the spirit of Governor Bates is often sensed, often seen through upper floor windows. He's always wearing a long black coat. And also, various objects in the house are moved at times, and no living hand could have done it. Now, this is a matter of human record. It can't be explained, nor can it be disproved. Ah, very well-known spot, Henry Shaw's mausoleum. Well, it's one of the most interesting structures in the Missouri Botanical Garden, though it is the smallest. It's the mausoleum of Henry Shaw that we see here in 1890, a year after he died. And today, 130 years later, this curious structure and its contents remain unchanged. In his life, Shaw displayed a strong interest in spiritualism and felt that those who passed to the other side could in some way be in touch with some of the living. Over the years since his death, it's been said that Shaw has been both seen and heard primarily to workers of the garden. This was first documented by his housekeeper of many years, Rebecca Adam, who reported that she had a number of visits and a number of conversations with the dead Shaw. The Legends of the Lamps. Now, uh, some of the Lemps live on in the afterlife. There was Adam Lemp, founder of the Brewing Empire. 
uh, who died of natural causes. His ghost is not around. And his son, Frederick, died of heart disease at the age of 28. His ghost is not around. But their son, uh, William J. Limp, took his own life, as did his son, William J. Billy Limp, Jr. Billy's sister, Elsa, committed suicide as well. Then Billy's and Elsa's brother, Charles, did himself in. All suicides were by gunshot. Three were at the Limp Mansion. And the first suicide was in 1904. The last was in 1949. Oh, excuse me, that was Louis Lemp. I forgot to mention him. I had pictures from 1890. He was a member of the Lemp family that you seldom hear about. Another of William Sr.'s children, Louis the Sr., he was age 20, putting a sharp-looking steed through its paces. He was 51 when he died in 1931. He is not one of the ghosts at the Lemp mansion, but he may someday show up to help the family get those ghostly affairs continued. Another haunted Lemp building from 1898 when the Lemp Brewery was doing a booming business. It's an artist's rendering of a cutoff view of part of the interior of the Lemp Brew House. Much of the structure remains, and by reports of many who have worked in this building, it's about as haunted as the Lemp Mansion or the cave. And that cave is kind of centered at Cherokee and what was 13th Street and reaches out in several directions like an octopus. For an overview of the subject of caves, I suggest the book Lost Caves of St. Louis by Hubert and Charlotte Rother. I wrote the forward to that, and in it I suggest that caves are a good place to stay out of. Here's a pre-ghost limp souvenir. It's a stein from the Lemp Employees Ball of 1903. Notice the famous shield insignia. When the Lemp Brewery closed its doors in 21, it sold the name Falstaff and that shield image to Papa Joe Grisadick of what was then called the Grisadick Beverage Company. He bought it for just $25,000. And it had not been for the creation of Landmarks Association in 1959 by Frank T. Hilliker and others, the Lemp and the Demonil Mansions and the east end of the brewery would have been done away with for the Ozark Expressway, which would become I-55. Now here's the famous or infamous house. There are ghost galore behind the walls of this 33-room limp mansion just north of Cherokee. And it's on uh, 13th Street originally. It's not down in Hill Place. It, if you visit there, take note of the large walk-in vaults on each floor. Uh, that's where the limps stored many of their valuables, and they had some fantastic art collections. And you'll probably see the silver room where servants did nothing but polish their vast collection of silver. The vaults are at the east end, the back of the building, and the silver room would be into the basement area that we see in the right of the building. And if you could go there, you'd see the remnants of a theater and a swimming pool, and some of what was built when part of the cave was used for the commercial Cherokee Cave that opened in 1945. It closed in 1961, as part of the cave was to be destroyed to make way for the I-55 highway. But to this day, um, underground, there's some 22,000 feet of walkable areas in the complex. I went down there with my son and with John Pertzborn and some cavers, and I was only too happy to get out of the place. That was about 35 years ago. I would never go back. And for a radio promotion in the 70s, I spent the night alone in the Limp Mansion, long before it was in part used as a B&B. &B. And I slept like a baby, undisturbed by any of the dead lamps. That's just one more of the 25 buildings that make up the Limp Brewery. If you look at it today, it appears practically the same as when this photo was made 120 years ago. The building is on the southwest corner of Broadway and Cherokee. Now look closely. And you'll see the limp shield, that's that logo on either side of that rounded corner section of the third floor. That's the logo that was later used by Falstaff. Into the underground, from above ground, here we see an old unused limp brewery building in the late 30s. It'd be redone for the entrance to what would be called Cherokee Cave. The limp and Demonil mansions would be on a rise that would be directly behind this building. All aboard. For a place that was once so incredibly busy, there's not a lot of ghostly activity at Union Station. Some experts in the occult arts say it's because the great majority of those who were there were in transition and not intimately connected with the station. Here are four exceptions. The ghost of a person known as the key keeper. 
Now, this key keeper in years gone by had a huge ring of keys for the many dozens of doors in the station. Well, office workers in the head house today say they can still hear the jangling of keys in corridors. And when investigating, of course, no one is ever found. Then there's the sound of coins. Oops, sorry. Then there's the sound of coins uh, that are often heard in the clock tower of the building, in which there are still several vaults and safes. These were once used by the railroads, but they're no longer in use. And even though the coins are heard, there are no people, at least those among the living who are in the tower. Over the past 115 years, a young woman dressed in the style of the time of this photo, which was taken in 1905, has been seen seemingly washing windows in the upper floors that are in the far distance on the right in this image. Reports are she was a maid in the terminal hotel section of the building and had fallen from a window to her death in this, the midway, but comes back to continue her work. Also, inexplicable murmurings of people and odd footsteps have been heard in air shafts that seem to emanate from the remains of the cave system that's under the great building. A uh, famous building, a lot of sea. If you're headed west of Lindell, right ahead will be Brookings Hall. The spirit of Robert Summers Brookings has been occasionally observed, not here at Brookings Hall, but rather at his one-time home at 5125 Lindell. But this well-known place that we see at Wash U that bears his name is haunted by his wife, Isabel. She died 55 years ago. Brookings Hall, along with Ridgely Library and Couples Hall, were constructed between 1901 and 4 for Wash U, but they were loaned to the Louisiana Purchase Exposition for the 1904 World's Fair Administration offices. Couples Hall is named for Samuel Couples, who was Robert Brookings' partner in a major woodenware business. Samuel Couples has equal time in the spirit world but he's to be found in his giant and beautiful mansion at 3679 West Pine Boulevard, now part of the campus of St. Louis University. His ghost was first identified there in 1912, which was the year of his death. And according to SLU archivist emeritus John Wade, Couples continues its ghostly activities. Not Casper, but here's a friendly ghost. This 1910 painting of Mary Easton Sibley was made 32 years after she had died. Mary, who loved children, though she had none of her own, started a school for girls in 1827 at a place called Linden Wood, so named for the many linden trees on the property. The school was started in a log building, but it was replaced in 1857 by a sizable building that's called Sibley Hall of what is now Lindenwood University. Since her passing in 1878, Mary is still there in spirit with the primary interest of looking out for and protecting the students. Theodore Lake is still with us. Here's a 1910 view of the shingle style residence. It's at 5900 West Cabinet Place, designed by Theodore Link, in which he and his family lived when he created Union Station. It said it's where his spirit has stayed since he died in 1923. He was one of our town's most acclaimed architects. Best known work is Union Station with that grand 233 foot high clock tower. Sadly, Link's spirit hasn't been able to keep his old house from falling on hard times, but I'm told things have improved a bit there, though in general, the neighborhood needs help. Oh, by the way, three other spirits have haunted Cabinet Place for over the a century. They're misty hooded figures and they're seen side by side going up and down the street only at night and they never touch the ground. They're about 18 inches above the pavement. Then they vanish, vanish into thin air when they reach either end of the street. Now you may not believe it, but ask the people who live on Cavity Place. They believe it's a tale of two ghosts. The St. Louis Artists Guild moved into the building at 812 Union Boulevard in 1908, designed by architects Louis Spearing, who also did design work for buildings at the fair. In 1912, he also created the Ethical Society Hall, now Sheldon Concert Hall in Washington. Now our look is inside the, uh, here at the Artist Guild in their second floor exhibition room, but the addition is the most haunted. It's the Little Theater that was added in 1916 and it's haunted by at least a couple of people. Members of the guild attested that Louis Spearing, the architect, had been seen there when plays were underway 
This is a very small theater. I think it probably holds about a, a hundred people. Uh, and according to many thespians who performed there, the late Irma Shira Tucker, she was a well-known local play producer and director and did much of her work at the Little Theater starting in 1937. And she's still around in spirit. The Artist Guild sold the building in 77 and over time it fell into disrepair, but it has been fully renovated. Now it's an event space called the Boo Cat Club, good name for it, owned by Patrick and Carol Shukart. They also reopened another place, Bevo Mill. They call it Das Bevo, and that is now not a restaurant anymore, but it is an event space. And yes, there is a ghost at Bevo Mill. It's the spirit of Bertha Schneidhorst the wife of Arthur B. Schneidhorst. Now they resided in a swank but kind of quirky apartment on the second and third floors of the round mill section. Uh, they both lived there from 39 to 47, he died then. And Bertha continued in the department into the mid fifties with Ginger, her pet Pomeranian, and she operated the restaurant uh, in the fifties. For more on other ghostly friends and fiends in their haunts, there are some books to consider. I'll show you some later on, like Spirits of St. Louis and Spirits of St. Louis II, written by Robbie Cordaway, uh, which I have several stories in it. Plus there's Lent, the Haunted History of the Lent Mansion by Stephen Walker, Ghost Stories in Missouri by A.S. Mott, and Haunted Webster Groves by Patrick Dorsey. There are dozens of ghost books about St. Louis. Well, Captain Bissell is at your service. This is from the High Park neighborhood, a block east of Grand on Randall Place in the shadow of the circa 1886 Bissell Water Tower. It's the haunted Bissell Mansion, constructed starting in 1823 for Louis Bissell, a captain of the U.S. Army, and he is said to still be on the premises, although his remains are interred at Bell Condom Cemetery. Well, there's a lot of stuff that is going on there, a lot of paranormal activity, uh, like the captain's ghost there to protect the remains of his property. Actually, the, his land contained around 1,500 acres at one time. Barb Shepper, who runs the place, uh, thanks the late Argus, August, artist Siegfried Reinhardt, who visited there lots of times, may be another ghost hanging around, so to speak. She had several of his paintings in display, including his self-portrait hanging over a fireplace. She and a worker saw the portrait seemingly to jump off the wall at the exact time he died of a heart attack on October 24th, 1984. Imagination? Coincidence? Eh, who's to say? Movers, shakers, and scalawags. Well, since I mentioned Belfont and Cemetery, a book packed with fascinating stories in a book of that title was written by Carol Shepley. And in that book, Bob Archibald, the former president of the Missouri Historical Society, wrote in part, there are lessons we can take from cemeteries. Now, these are not places of morbid fascination, he went on to say, or the grim lairs of ghouls and ghosts. But I think there are more than a few people not in agreement with Bob's thoughts on the subject. <clears throat> there was a tragic fire at 1.58 a.m. on March 10th, 1914, the first alarm was sounded to bring the fire department to the old Missouri Athletic Club at 4th and Washington. Incidentally, I just got this new book yesterday. It is just released, and it's called St. Louis Fire Station. It shows all the fire stations in the history of St. Louis, some of which are haunted, but that's not in the book. Uh, the responding fire department came from Engine House 4041, which was at 707 North 11th Street, the closest operating firehouse to this conflagration. Well, the situation went from bad to worse that night. And in a very short time, even though the nine-year-old seven-story building was considered to be fireproof, it burnt out completely, certainly wasn't. And the results can be seen in this picture taken on that terrible day. The building, which is actually owned by Boatman's Bank, which occupied most of the first floor, was a total loss. The morning after, Here's a look a day later as firefighters were gathered in a section of what was left of the building as they continued their search for the dead. In all, there were uh, finally a total of 37 people that had been found dead, but not everyone has been accounted for. And there could have been more who perished in the conflagration that has the odious honor of being the deadliest fire in St. Louis history. Well, like the Phoenix, it rose from the ashes. Less than two weeks after the fire, it was decided 
to build a new Missouri Athletic Club that of the one that had burned there. This is the same spot, right in the same location. There's the structure that we can see today. Looks the same now. It was built in March, opened in March 1st, 1916. And from that point in time to now, there are some people who visit, who stay there, but there's hotel rooms there too, or work there, who on occasion feel a sense of sadness or uneasiness in the building. Psychic investigators say this may be the spirits of some who died at that site, and it could be that they're there to protect the living, not to scare them. Well, a beplumed pearl, strange tale of pearl and patience, this pearl current caused a worldwide sensation by our association with a person from another time and place named Patience Worth. It was the spirit of Patience credited with writing such odd things as companioning is a strange, strange thing. He who would know a fellow must know his dreams, must see his soul through the parted curtain. The presence of Patience beginning in July 1913 was done through a Ouija board that was being used by the West End housewife, Pearl Curran, and she, uh, from the 20th century, living woman, of course, and she contacted Patience, an early 17th century spirit that the board reportedly conjured for her. Patience started the contact with the word, many moons ago I live, again I come. Patience Worth is my name. The Parker Brothers board game. In case you've never seen a Ouija board, this is what it looks like. And that heart-shaped device on the right called a planchette is what's used to get messages through automatic writing delivered on the board from the unseen. It's a must for seances, but many people are very afraid of it. Pearl wasn't. Uh, she and patients wrote poems, stories, plays, books, totaling over four million words. Quite a story, and for a short version, I suggest Robbie Cordoway's book, Spirits of St. Louis II. Um, more of the story is available on Patience Worth, A Psychic Mystery by Casper Yost. Jury is still out as to whether Patience was an actual spirit, an innocent creation in Pearl's subconscious mind, or a money-making con game. If you'd care to experiment with a Ouija board, one similar to Pearl's is sold by Amazon right now for $20.99. And there's one offered by Grand and Road for $69. Here's where it all started. This in 1913 was the building in which John and Pearl Curran lived at 6601 Kingsbury Avenue. Uh, their flat was on the first floor of the building on the left. Pearl died in 1937. Patience has not been heard from since. The Coliseum was haunted. In 1908, when the Coliseum was built in North Jefferson between Locust and Washington, it was the biggest public building in the United States. It would hold such events as the 1916 Democratic National Convention, two appearances of Enrico Caruso with the Metropolitan Opera Company, many editions of the annual Bayville Profit Ball, and, and also housed our town's first automobile show and countless swimming events with stars such as Johnny Weissmiller. They were conducted in this saltwater pool. The ghost who haunted the Coliseum was that of Guy Golderman, the person who spearheaded its creation and was its first manager. Then in 1917, Guy was also a driving force in the start of what we now call the Muni. And in 33, he was a leader in the development of the municipal later Keel, then Peabody Opera House, now known as the Stiefel Theater and the Convention Center. And in 1918, Guy Golderman produced the first official gold record, which was General John J. Pershing's Battlefield Address. That disc still exists and is somewhere in St. Louis in a private collection. Well, the end was coming, <clears throat> as you can see. Here's how the Coliseum looked in the 40s. It had closed in 1937. Its demise was precipitated by the opening of those places, the Municipal Opera, the, the arena too, in 1929. Final blow came when the Opera House and Auditorium opened in 34. Kind of a ghost itself at the Coliseum at this point in the 40s. The place seemed to be a ghost of the past, as was a ghostly place underneath it, Urig's Cave, which had been an entertainment venue on the site that we see. The cave is still there, shrouded in the blackest solitude under Jefferson. Coliseum was demolished in 1953 due to its condemnation and nothing of any consequences ever been erected on that site. 
The ghost light is on. Theaters through the centuries have often been classified as haunted, and we've had several in St. Louis, including this one that we see at the start of the Great Depression. It was then known as the World Theater, not the world that uh, for some time was uh, the name of the small downtown theater in the 500 block of St. Charles. The world we're looking at was on Grand Elf Square, and it's still there, still used. It's a theater for the Grand Center Arts Academy. That's in the former Knights of Pythias and later Carter Carburetor Office Building in Grand at Grand Elf Square, right across from what was the St. Louis Theater, now Powell Hall. And yes, that too is a haunted building, specifically by a guy named George. The theater. Oops, excuse me, pardon me. The theater we see here had more names than any other theater in St. Louis. It opened in 1913 as the Victoria. It was a German language house for plays, concerts, and opera. Name was changed in World War I to the Liberty, then the Fox Liberty when it was taken over by William Fox 11 years before he built our fabulous Fox Theater, which is another place spirits are known to hang out. Other names of the theater we're looking at were The Sun, The Club 400, The Faith Tabernacle, The Lynn Theater Project Company, then back to The Sun, which is its name today. Muriel Wegraff, who for a long, long while was superintendent of this building, insisted it was haunted by people speaking German, sounds of things being moved, weak sounds of music and singing, muted, unintelligible voices. And all of this was when the building was closed and unused for years. Oh, the ghost light. That's a tradition in theaters everywhere, and it's a clear, bright bulb on a stand to keep ghosts away. And plus, it also helps stagehands and actors from running into scenery or falling into the orchestra pit. Be afraid, <clears throat> boy, be very afraid. Both the book and the movie The Exorcist are filled with the stuff nightmares are made of, some real, some fiction, but what makes the story all the worse is that most of it really happened and most of it really happened here. This strange story of demonic possession that took place in 1949 was precipitated by using a Ouija board. Eh, Ouija board again. If you've never read the 1971 book or seen the 1973 movie, both written by William Peter Blatty, who got an Academy Award for his screenwriting, consider looking at it and reading it too. This is the famous St. Francis Xavier Church, College Church on the campus of St. Louis U in which some of the fight by priests and others to free a young boy from the sheer terror of being controlled by Satan happened. Boy was possessed in Maryland, but was brought to St. Louis to be exorcised. He stayed at an aunt's house in Belnor at 8435 Roanoke Drive, and some of the relatives stayed at the Melbourne Hotel, now Jesuit Hall, right across from the college church. A part of the work related to the exorcism took place in the church rectory and Verhagen Hall. Now, they're in the picture just to the right of the church. Both have since been torn down. But most of the exorcism took place in the mental ward of Alexian Brothers Hospital, which has also been raised. Father Paul Stark, SJ, expert on exorcism, said it was a real thing even worse than the book or movie, and that makes it pretty bad. Catholic Church strongly suggests you consult a priest if you feel an exorcism needs to take place on someone because uh, they believe in this. Father Walter Halloran from St. Louis U was the priest who was primarily involved in the endeavor to release the 11 year old child from the grip of the devil, a boy, but in the book and the movie, it was the girl. In the movie it was played by Linda Blair who lived in at one time in Webster Groves. Uh, others assisting in the exorcism included Father William Bowdern pastor of St. Francis Xavier Church. I actually saw them and met them uh, several times in 1949 when I too was 11, but not possessed. Um, I was helping at the soda fountain, my grandfather's drugstore at Vandeventer and West Pine, right at the edge of the SLU campus. And they'd come in for chocolate malts. They were 30 cents each. And I'd hear them tell about the problems they were having with a young boy and the devil. It was a very interesting conversation. Now to cut to the chase, as they say, uh, they were unable to drive Satan out of the boy, whose name was Roland, until they got some help from heaven. Heaven sent help with the form of St. Michael the Archangel, who appeared in the boy's room at the hospital and above the altar of the college church. Here's a ghost from not that long ago, our old friend the Admiral, and its Plebeyside Dock, America's largest excursion boat. 
right? It was a beautiful place. Started its cruising in 1940. Those cruises came to an end in 78. It was an entertainment and casino venue until 2010. Tom Dunn, who worked for the Admiral's owner, Streckva Steamers, the original owners, for many decades, said the ghosts he had personally heard of on the boat were Fred Williams, who was a very friendly, long-time porter, who I guess just didn't want to leave, and Maisie Krebs from Southwest St. Louis, who designed the Art Deco interior and exterior of the boat. Ralph Hoffman of Remain Sales, whose company dismantled the Admiral for scrap metal, often felt an unearthly presence as he walked the decks of the completely empty boat, and he said he had occasionally see usually at the far other end of the boat, a shadowy figure that he didn't know what it was because he knew he was the only living person on the boat. Here's a ghostly place. In this image, we see two workmen removing a cell door from the former 11th District Station on Newstead between Laclede and West Pine. Go there and look at this place. It's on the east side of the street. I mean, it's a very spooky looking building from the top to the bottom. Uh, the large structure opened in 1905, and it was used for its original purpose until 1960. One of the best known stories of the station happened on the evening of October 5th, 1953, when Police Lieutenant Lewis Shoulders and Sergeant Elmer Dolan arrested Carl Austin Hall for his role in the kidnapping and murder of six-year-old Bobby Greenlee, son of a wealthy Kansas City Cadillac dealer, where they brought Hall and two large metal suitcases containing the ransom money to this Newstead station. The sum was $600,000, largest amount of ransom to have ever been paid in this country. Bonnie Emily Hetty, who was Hall's accomplice, was also caught, but half the money was missing. And to this day, it still is. A popular belief that was that Shoulders and maybe Dolan hid the money in a secret spot, such as behind a wall somewhere in that building. And even after several interior reconstructions, nothing is found, or if it was found, nobody reported it. But there are a lot of ghost stories from this building, uh, which all started in 1944 when a Mexican immigrant uh, committed suicide in one of the cells. Uh, Post-dispatch reporter Jack Rice was called to the building to check for ghosts because in a large room in the center of the second floor, you could hear footsteps when nobody was there. And he went into what had been an apartment owned by Howard Jones, an artist, in the south side of the second floor. And in addition to the footstops, they would come to the door. You could be holding the doorknob, and the doorknob would turn. You open it, and nobody was there. Or it, it, but you have, could have no light, so not even a flashlight, or it wouldn't happen. But as soon as the light went on, the ghosts were gone. And our ghosts are gone for right now, because we need to hear questions and comments from our ghostly audience. And uh, I can go over some things with uh, Tammy as far as books are concerned. Uh, so <clears throat> I just want to mention one book first. This one is, uh, this is a kind of a must-have book if you want to do your search yourself. The Wiser Field Guide to Ghosts, Apparitions, Spirits, Spectral Lights, and Other Hauntings. A lot of history and a lot of how-to. How do you find ghosts if you want to, or how do they find you? So what do you got as far as questions, Miss Tammy? Well, we've got a lot of the audience that's just sending their love to you and thanking you for doing this uh -huh. wonderful program. And I have oh, a few sweetie. questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, here is a question from Julie. She wanted to know um, the program by Valerie Shrimp mentioned at the beginning. What was the name of that program? Well, that's that is an article in the Post Dispatch from. Gosh, I think it might have been last weekend, Sunday post, I'm not sure. Within the last two weeks, it's called What Lies Beneath. And it talks about cemeteries that parks have been built on top of. Uh, not necessarily meaning that they are all haunted, but it's a very interesting one. It doesn't cover all of them, but there are some in Missouri and some in Illinois. So Post-Dispatch, uh, and the title was What Lies Beneath. And her husband, Andy, is the director of the Campbell House Museum, uh, which is a wonderful place to visit, and it is definitely haunted. <laughs> so what fun stories can you tell about that haunting? We love the Campbell House. Well, isn't it nice? Well, the uh, Robert and Mrs. Campbell are there, and the last son to uh, pass away there uh, supposedly is there as well, because he never no, wanted to leave. And the people, that, uh, the, the children that lived on, never wanted to change anything. They wanted everything the same. So this is the most authentic 
house in St. Louis, historic house. I mean, they, it's the original furniture and the silverware and the dishes and the clothes that they wore, the, the carriage that's still in the, um, well, I would call it a garage today for a carriage house. So people are seen usually at a window. Andy would be the one to tell you more about it. For a long time, they didn't want to admit they had a ghost or two, but they do now, uh, but they're friendly. You know, most ghosts are friendly. Uh, you very seldom find somebody that is really causing problem or causing harm to anyone. It does happen, but it's it's more of a poltergeist than a ghost. So um, we had another viewer say that um, their dad was a retired postman and used to talk about the caves back in the day. Um, he would deliver the mail, and he believed that there was a cave between. Um, from Lep Mansion or the brewery, which is now blocked off. And I know that you've actually been down there, haven't you? I have. I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like it at all. I hated it. I had to go down. There's uh, <clears throat> probably shouldn't tell people this, but uh, means if somebody might try to do it, don't do it. Trust me, don't do it. <laughs> there was another Lemp Mansion, which was on the northwest corner of what is now uh, Demonel and Cherokee Street. And there had been an entrance to, in the cave from there, also an entrance uh, to the cave in the Lemp Mansion itself, which is totally sealed off. You can't get to it. But this house had been moved, and there was, a, I think it's called the General Candy Company, was on that property, just a nondescript building. And in the center of their parking lot would look like a big uh, uh, sewer lid, but much larger. Well, we got that off and had a one of those rope and metal ladders with miners hats on and we went down and it's pretty far down. We're about 40 feet to approximately under the street and took a tour through there. And it um, I, it was very scary with the lemon. You could see the remnants of the, some of the scenery of where the, where the lamps had a theater and how the ceiling had been painted. You could see their swimming pool that they used, and the pool was had heated water and was heated by steam from the brewery, which was right across the street. And we went off in different directions and uh, the air got very, very bad, really bad. I, uh, I was shaking like that. And I realized it's, you know, really cool down there, but I was perspiring. The pers perspiration was literally pouring off me. I was being so, uh, so everybody closed me decided that I better get out of there. It didn't affect anybody else. And the hardest thing I ever did in my life was going up that ladder, that just swinging ladder. Oh my gosh, I really never thought I was going to get out of there. So I really don't recommend, even if you have found your way in, don't go in. And if you ever go to a um, cave or a haunted place, always go with someone else. Never go alone and always let someone know where you are. Now, if you're in a cave, you can't, the cell phones don't work there. Uh, you can't make a call out or a call is not coming in. So, you know, something could happen and you may not be able to get out alive. You may just stay down there for the rest of your existence. <laughs> well, you know, I, up until this moment, I've always wanted to go into some of those caves, but now you've scared me. So <laughs> Good, maybe I hope not. So. <laughs> <laughs> like Like Yurig's cave, have you been um, in that location? I've only seen in Yurik's cave. Yurik's cave was kind of centered at Washington and Jefferson. Right. Uh, and it continued on man-made and partially a railroad tunnel down to the Yurik Brewery uh, on Market Street, right about where Union uh, Station is. Uh, and it was it was a commercial cave. They had a decor they decorated it in, in sort of an Egyptian motif. So if you ever see any workmen there digging up the street on Jefferson, west side of Jefferson, especially right at Washington down to Locust. And if you got a nice bright flashlight, you can look down there and you can see some of what was there. So you can see that something had been down there beside just a natural cave. But I've never- Oh, I bet the city workers would love that if we all show yeah. up with our flashlight. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they would. <laughs> we'll just say rabbit sent us. <laughs> yeah, just say I sent you, right, right. Well, I think Any this is gonna- other questions from our viewers? I think that might wrap up our questions. Um, how about we'll give them a couple more minutes. If you could stop sharing your screen, I'll just pop up something and that will give us a few more minutes. Okay, let me, can I show you something real quick? Sure. Okay, I just wanna show you these. Just so you can see what they look like. Uh, this is that Spirits of St. Louis book by Robbie Cordaway. 
and she has a Spirits of St. Louis book too. Now these are available at the History Museum Library. It's probably not for sale anymore. Uh, here's another good ghost book about Herman, Herman's Haunts. This is the uh, Haunted Odyssey, uh, Ghosts of the Mississippi Valley. Uh, one that came out a couple of years ago by Webster Groves, Haunted Webster Groves, especially Plant Street. Now, this is not a ghost book. It's not available unless you go to, uh, libraries would have it, eBay would probably get it. It's called The Streets of St. Louis by the Magnums, uh, but they do talk a lot about haunted places in it and, and how they got that. We, we mentioned Dr. McDowell, his book uh, is Mad Dr. McDowell that talks about what he did in that place and why it's haunted. A lot of people want to know about cemeteries. Uh, this is Kevin Amsler's book, Final Resting Place. I think that's still available. And it, like the Fulkerson Mansion is a big haunted place if you get in Jerseyville, Illinois, for example. But there are a lot of ghosts in Alton. A lot of people say, say Alton is the most haunted city in the United States. Uh, there's a book that came out by uh, David Bauer called Secret St. Louis. It's a lot about weird, wonderful, obscure things. There are some ghosts in there. Now, this is not a ghost book, but I love this book. It's uh, Limp with the Haunting History, but it has more than ghosts in it. It's about the whole history of the limps by Stephen Walker. And Mary Bartley wrote a book called St. Louis Lost. Not a ghost book, but it includes a lot of the houses that were are, are haunted, many on Vandeventer Place. That because Vandeventer Place is all gone, except for that nice entrance is that just uh, next to the jewel box in Forest Park. And a lot of people say, well, where did the ghost go? Like uh, the Goldenrod Showboat was haunted by a uh, Victoria, an actress in a red dress, and Captain Bill Menke, who ran it for all those years. Uh, so what happens? It's gone. It's burned. The ghosts usually disappear. Sometimes ghosts can go to another place, but generally they have been in one spot, and if for whatever reason that's gone, they're gone. So you've got things to show us. Um, I I do. I need you to uh, stop sharing your screen. Thank you. And then while I'm going to set mine up, we do have one more question. Of course, it's about the exorcism. Um, and this viewer wanted to know if you were actually able to speak to the pastor that was involved or the priest that was involved um, in the exorcism. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, uh, to two of them, uh, they, as I said, we used to come to my grandfather's drugstore on a regular basis. And I was just a little kid. I was just 11 years old. Uh, but, the, you know, we talked about a lot of things and they talked about what they were doing in the study. I didn't, didn't really understand much of it. It was just like a general conversation. They were standing at the soda fountain when they came in. And I probably got to see them there. Maybe, I don't, I don't remember how many times, probably about 10 times over a period of a couple of months. Uh, and that's, that was one of the main topics of their discussion because this was a big deal for them. This was a, a big exorcism. And of course, we're talking about 1949, long before anybody knew about it, long before there was a book or the movie came out. But I'll tell you, that's uh, truly one of the scariest books and scariest movies. And I guess the real thing is it, it, it's real. It really, really did happen. So I did get to know them, but I really didn't understand everything, that, who they were and what they were, why they were talking about what they were talking about. Sure. Well, truth be told, I've never seen the movie and never will. <laughs> I'm too scared. I can't even watch the commercials. Um, <laughs> well, I know we need to end, but um, someone was asking if, you could post or we can email them links to the books that you mentioned or just names of the books. Um, we do have everybody's email and we do have um, their their questions. So if we have that list, we can send it out to everybody. Oh, sure. Well, I will prepare a list for you and I'll do more than we showed today. I'll give you several more books that relate oh, to it. Perfect. Well, Great. thank you so, so much. This is always so much fun. It's so interesting. I wrote down little tidbits, and I'm sure everybody in the audience did as well. But promise me that we can do this next year as our discovery tour. Oh, I would if love all goes to do well. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Thank you all so much, all our, our viewers. Thank you all for tuning in. And if um, 
you can just take our brief survey after this is over. We would really appreciate it. You can see on the screen some of the programs we have coming up. If you have little ones, tonight is going to be a fun. It's a healthy history love and Halloween party on, on the screen, of course. And then a couple other wonderful programs coming up. So again, thank you so much, Rabbit. This was wonderful and everything we could ask for. Oh, great. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.